usual vlog. I just woke up, as you can tell. Vlog uh, locations. I'm down here in County Kerry at the moment, and I just got out of the shower. Put my hat on. Do hide my thinning hair and keep the Hocus Focus logo flying. Which Hocus Focus is on Sarah's channel again tonight. There was one recorded. Uh, I'm down here in County Kerry, to in the middle of nowhere, Gaelic Ireland, a very incredibly beautiful place, uh, to do a talk in a deconsecrated Christian church on paganism. Take that, St. Patrick. The serpents have returned. Now, that's not what I'm talking about today. Uh, I'm going to talk about something else. Now, the other day, about five or six days ago, I got talking to a guy in a cafe and he, he said to me, uh, he was saying, isn't it awful what's happening to the poor people in Gaza? And I said, yeah, but I don't care. And he looked at me like, like that. And he says, what do you mean? I says, I can't care. There's nothing I can do about it. And even so, I says, Ireland is my country and my, my clear and present you know, agenda is is my own country, and from that Europe, probably the in Europe, you know, you know, but Ireland would always come first, not because I'm an ultra-nationalist, but this is the country I live in, I was born in, I choose to make my home, so I have a, I have a, I have a duty to safeguard and steward the the quality and the meaning of life on this island, in order to keep it going for future generations, and I see. My part in that is keeping the culture going and to keep people focused on themselves as a Gaelic, Celtic and, you know, to a lesser degree, Nordic tribe that we have here and understand that this is the only place we can do it. And he says to me, but like, you know, how are we ever going to do that? And I says, well, I'm a great believer in, in direct talking to people. And I said, I have a YouTube channel, and it's, it's you know, it's, it reaches a, a, an okay number of people. And uh, that's that's the best I can do. And he says, would you run for election? I said, oh, God, no, never. And he says, why is that? And I says, I despise democracy. I think it's horrible. And that was even worse than to him than me saying, I'm not getting involved in the whole Gaza thing, and I don't care. And um, I'm Irish. I know I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to lick the skin of the gin. I'm not going to be gin infected like quite a few of them in the old scene here in Ireland and the old scene around the world are now. And, uh, you know, they have to keep the cannabis fund up, you know. So throw a few, you know, you know they'll, they'll, they'll praise uh, Hezbollah stuff to the hilt and talk about, you know, compassion. But, you know, as long as you're, you're donating to the cannabis fund and they'll show you all the pictures of dead Arab babies with their brains hanging out that you need. But I don't think like that. My duty is to this country, and to the to my my love my 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 people and my tribe and around the world, everyone you know, everyone who's willing to hear the message. I don't care what race, religion, or anything you are. You've all got to work on your own tribe. I know people who are African Americans who've given up on who follow my work who've given up on Christianity and they realize that they were that was that was a huge part of what was done to their ancestry. And so that's what I see myself. So he said, I'd he said to me, I'd love to see it. I, I, he said, I, I would love to see a try to tell people that democracy is evil. Well, sir, challenge accepted. As an anarchist, I, 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 it, it, it does not behoove me or, you know, enchant me to quote Karl Marx. Uh, but Karl Marx made a, a statement once and he said, democracy was doomed for no other reason than it will bankrupt the nation. The reason it will bankrupt the nation is that politicians and the bureaucracy will use the treasury and the, the revenue generated by taxation in order to buy elections. Now, that's exactly what's happening right now. But there's also, it, it, that was how it would have been perceived in the past and exactly how it was you know, pork barreling and all that kind of stuff, junkets for the bureaucrats and all the people and the media who served them. But 
there's also an element of futures trading that crept in in the United States around the time of the 1840s, 1850s, when large numbers of Irish immigrants started to arrive on the shores of the United States. The Democratic Party, who prior to that, there was the party of slavery, uh, the party of it, you know, killing Irish immigrants, Catholic ones, the, the party of the worst kind of sectarian, Presbyterian hillbillies, decided that they should start futures trading. And so you've all seen the film Gangs of New York, where the guy, the politician, the local politician, the Tammany Hall thing, the politician stands at the dock, uh, the Irish immigrants come down while the, you know, the nativists are throwing rocks at them saying, go on home, Paddy. And then he runs up and says, welcome, welcome, my Irish friends. Here's sign here and you get a, you, you, a bowl of soup and a sandwich waiting for you. Sign here and you get, this is your U.S. citizenship and sign here. Many of these people couldn't speak English. They spoke, you know, Gaelic. Sign here and you get your... Um, your membership to the Democratic, Par Democratic Party. And the whole idea was, Boss Tweed, Tammany Hall and all that stuff, and it worked, would be that the Irish would go, sure, when we came off the boat, you know, they, they all hated us, except for, you know, the Democrats. So I'll vote for Democrats, it's all my kids. You know, this kind of thing. And without understanding, it was a cynical ploy to steal, to steal their influence, not to actually help them. Uh, because as soon as the next groups came along, whether they were Germans, Italians, Jews, uh, Hispanics, uh, the Democrats uh, then pandered to them. And during the civil rights thing, which was a result of the Democrats, the racist Democrats in the South who really caused all that, uh, they, uh, they bought the African-American vote. And this is, so this is how you have a situation where you have in the United States now, where literally the, the vote is bought you know, through pandering. And now, this is now, in Ireland, this is now what they're doing, and in Britain, but I, I, I can only talk in an Irish context. In Ireland, the political parties, particularly the left-wing parties, but none of them are immune to this evil and this treachery. All of them, Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil, the lot. They're flooding this country with people from Africa and the Middle East for the same reason particularly the, the, the small left parties, the lunatic parties like Sinn Féin, uh, Labour, uh, Social Democrats and people before profit, the extreme Bolshevik parties, uh, they're currently in a state of absolute psychosis at the moment. They're, they're, they're not wearing burkas, they're wearing that, you know, that kind of tea towel that they wear around their neck in, that, in, the, in the Arab world and looking like Yasser Arafat. Now, and, and screaming about, you know, we have to help the people of Gaza. They don't give a fuck about the people of Gaza, no matter how much they tremble and shake. They're trying to get them all moving to Ireland. And for the simple reason was they think that there'll be a future constituency. So, you know, you know, so Abdul from Gaza, his son, Mohammed, living in Dundalk, will go, Bismillah. It was, it was people before Prophet Sinn Féin who, who gave my father freedom in Ireland. Uh, Bismillah, uh, peace be upon the Prophet's name. I will vote for Sinn Féin or people before Prophet or Finn Gael or whoever it was that seduced them. They're all doing it, by the way. And that's what the, that's what the likes of Boyd Barrett and Mary Lou, Mary Lou MacDonald, Varadkar, Michal Martin and the rest of them all are up to. They think that's what's happening, that's going to happen. In reality, what they'll do is they'll vote for a Gaelic Islamic party. It'll be called on, you know, on, you know, on Islam of the hell or something like that. Uh, you know, they'll try and make it, it'll be trying to make it Irish, but it'll have a, they'll have the crescent on it, this kind of thing. That's who they'll vote for. They won't vote for a, a, an Irish, the parties that are currently committing mass treason, human trafficking people into this country so they can get their votes. And that's why democracy is evil. A democracy is evil because it's used by politicians to buy future elections. It's not, it doesn't serve, it's really, it's not, it's mob rule in the truest sense. And it doesn't work. Now you could have a situation where you have a strictly guarded Republican constitution, where you could have a Republican democracy, what they used to have in the United States, what they used to have in Ireland, where you had strict constitutional bindings 
to stop this kind of carry on or to at least put an end to it when it started but our constitutions have been slowly demolished by supreme courts and high courts within republican governments such as ireland such as france such as germany such as the united states and demolish them in order to um to you know to do this future trading in importing mass numbers of people from africa and the middle east and in order to hopefully use them as the party's future in the same way tammany hall and boss tweed did the same with the Irish immigrants in the 1840s, 50s and 60s. Now, so that's why democracy is doomed. That's why the ballot box is held up as this sacred tabernacle. You must, you must, you must, you know, your vote counts. Uh, if you don't vote, you won't get what you want, this kind of thing. And uh, your ancestors died for you to have the vote. Well, they may have died to have the vote in, you know, a patriotic, you know, Republican democratic republic they didn't vote for you to be able to use the vote to vote for parties who are buying the election uh, so they can basically replace you in the future with abdullahs and mohammeds and you know half of nigeria you, this is a uh, this is so so it, in the past it, the politicians at the docks in new york and boston and philadelphia and baltimore gave the irish a bowl of soup and a sandwich in Ireland, they give the the immigrants as soon as they arrive uh, a, a free house and full social welfare. That's why, that's why when you bring this up, you have an animal like uh, Michal Martin going, "Where's your humanity, mate?" What he's really saying is, "Why won't you help me keep this party in business, boy?" That's what he's really saying. And uh, when they call you racist, they're saying, "Stop cutting, sh stop trying to affect my business model." When they say, when they call people in Ballymun, East Wall, around the country, for my now down in Ross Lair, when they call them far right, what they're saying is, uh, these, this is, these are, this is turf wars. You think of like, uh, it's a protection racket. You think of like, uh, the, the organized crime goes into a town. If anybody in that town tries to stop the organized crime with a protection racket, uh, the, the gangsters will do things like, um, you know, kill them. Or, you know, uh, threaten them and say, you know, uh, Vito and the boys are going to be around later if you don't shut up. And then the locals don't shut up, you know. Then they make them a, a me they send out a message of like, you know, what the whole thing, making you an offer you can't refuse. Well, that's exactly what politicians are doing in towns around Ireland and in your country as well. When people say, we can't take in, this town's a population of 2,000 people, we can't take in 3,000 men and put them in all the whole local hotels without without and they go you're a, you're a far right racist that's the protection record cancel culture is one of the most insidious things in the world at least the bolsheviks killed you cancel culture they destroy your life and keep you alive so you know it every day of your life this is how evil our politicians are i'm if you're an irish person i want you to pay terrific attention to this when you switch on the tv and they show you a rock and the rockless report and there are the politicians of Ireland. You remember you're dealing with the most evil creatures on the, on, on, living in this country. They are pure evil. They are willing to make you, your children, and everyone ex around you extinct in order to change the demographic of this country into a Gaelic caliphate in order to win elections in the future. And you vote for these people, you trust these people, you're telling me that democracy works, that if you start a new party, it'll be different. Give me a break, nothing will be different. Democracy is designed for that purpose. Democracy is designed to destroy you in order to put um, the, the, the demographic that will feed their business model uh, you know, diversity at the moment, sometimes climate change, but that's their business model. And if you get in the way of their business model, you face cancel culture. And cancel culture is actually, when the Bolsheviks dragged people into the basements in Eastern Europe and shot them in the head, they were actually more humane than cancel culture. A cancel culture is the domain of the most insidious beasts possible because they don't do you the, the favor of killing you. They destroy your life and keep you alive. So every day of your life, you're reminded that your life has been destroyed. 
anyone who involves themselves in cancel culture is someone that we should never have anything to do with. If you know anyone who boycotted a, a shop for some reason over a personal choice the person made, perhaps not giving a wedding cake to a gay couple, that's their private business. They should have. They, they should be allowed to do and serve whom they want. Uh, of course, I wouldn't do something like that. But I'm sure someone like Christian Mars would say, "I'd agree with that shop if that's their business. That's what they want to do." And he's a gay man. You should never. And then people organize a boycott to try to destroy the business. You should never ever have anything to these these people. And this is how we win. We win by isolating the profane, the the you know the curs of the curs in the face of natural law, because. Democracy is unnatural. It's not a natural situation. A natural situation is strong leadership of a tribe, a community, a people, or a region that comes about as a result of people who have earned the right to hold it. Not experts like today, they're often the weakest, but people who have demonstrated uh, the psychological, emotional, and compassionate fortitude enough to actually do this and to express common sense. Democracy will never achieve this, ever. It's all a scam. What will achieve it is some kind of anarcho-capitalist system where people are allowed to live their lives with as little interference from the government in a kind of a libertarian way without, without any kind of political mandate or you know, philosophical non-concept behind it. Purely an administrative function to allow humans to pursue human happiness and to protect those who are vulnerable in society from ones who might prey upon them. That's all they need to do. That's, you know, and allow them to own their own home, start their own businesses and so on. And you'll still have, you know, a court system to protect them. I'm, I can't imagine any system that's better than an anarcho anarcho-capitalism. It allows people to pursue their dreams in life without interference from the government or philosophical mandates or the most poisonous of all today, governments like the Irish government and every government now in the West sitting there and going, uh, what's my orders today? What do I believe in today? You know, this kind of thing. And one of the main ways the, the, the beast of democracy has destroyed Ireland, Ireland has they bought the farmers off. Far, farming in Ireland has been destroyed by EU grants. For instance, the sugar beet industry. We once had a huge sugar beet industry here. And someone in the EU decided, well, sugar growers in the Caribbean deserve a break. Now, I thought the purpose of the European Union was to help Europe. Well, no, no, we have to help sugar growers in, 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 in you know, Jamaica and Trinidad. So they shut down the Irish sugar beet industry by paying farmers not to grow sugar beet just like they paid them not to farm. But foreigners often come to Ireland and say, I see all this land and all this here, cows and sheep. Yeah, that's, that's the EU. They tell them to get a few cows, get a few sheep, sit at home, and uh, here's your 800 euros a week. That's what it's like. And Leo Varadkar, this, this, this insidious beast, stood up in front of farmers the other day and said, uh, the, greatest, the greatest threat facing Irish agriculture is is climate change. Now, you would expect half the farmers in that hall to burst out laughing. No, but they've already been told by the IFA, an insidious organization, the Irish Farmers Association, that don't worry, lads, you'll be getting a payment not to farm or to let your, your land grow wild again for climate change. You'll get, you'll get a climate change supplement. So you'll be on a thousand euros a week. Don't worry about it, lads. Don't worry about it. And that's how they destroyed Irish farming. Democracy, vote for me, I'll get you money from Europe and you never have to farm ever again. Of course, there's farmers like Pat Newell and other farmers around the country, I know quite a few, who don't live like that and want that they farm for the love of it. But unfortunately, they're a tiny minority. And that's just how they destroyed the Irish countryside and farming. And, uh, but there's, there's, all, there's other backlashes to that too. There's more organic farmers and things like that. And people who don't come from a farming background who see like a small farm being left, left to rot. And say, that's an awful shame. The fields are all nicely drained. The hedgerows are great. There's some nice equipment and there's lovely sheds there. And then they buy that land and then they start doing horticulture for themselves and maybe selling a few vegetables in the, in the, in the local village or town. So there's, there's, you know, there's always, not, that's natural law kicking into action. So, uh, I, you know, I ha there's a lot of people saying things like, well, 
you know, Ireland is done. It's finished. You know, we now have so many people from Africa and the Middle, the Middle East living here that the Irish people are done. You have to remember, folks, and a, a big part of me feels sorry for these immigrants too because they're living here against natural law. The only reason they're surviving in Ireland is social welfare and central heating. If social welfare and central heating was turned off, basically all the Africans and Middle Eastern people here would have to leave. Otherwise they would die. It's central heating that's keeping them alive in the winters here. Uh, the Irish damp climate is terrible from people from the Middle East and from Africa. And all you have to do is go to the Irish hospital and see how many of them have lung infections and stuff. It's killing them. And on top of that, the food is not right for them and things like that. And they're not getting enough vitamin D from the sun if they're not getting any at all. And so they come to Ireland, they might get a nice place to live. They might get molly collared by the politicians, but they're basically entering an environment that natural law is not good for them. The nature, natural environment. If something happened like a solar flare or EMP and uh, all the electricity was switched off for a couple of winters, all those people would die if they couldn't make their way back to Africa or a warm, hot country. They would die. They, it's central heating is keep, they're literally living on a life support system. I remember one time someone asked me, I, I love Switzerland, would you live there? And I said, it's a beautiful looking country, but you couldn't pay me to live in Switzerland or any Scandinavian nation. And he said, why? Well, not, I said, they're not nations, they're life support systems. They're, they're just basically life support systems. They, don't prov they provide the means to survive and to you know, be comfortable and not have to, but they don't provide anything else. And, if that, and it's a very fickle thing. You know, it can be turned off very easily. And that's what's happened with these people. They could, they could lose it all. And, I mean, if they stop the social welfare tomorrow for immigrants, we'd probably lose a half a million of them overnight. They'd all head back. They'd all head. That's why they're coming here. The social welfare paid to people from the third world in Ireland is absolutely astounding. You know, I think they, they, they land here and they're guaranteed a minimum of 200 euros a week. You know, try, you work in Poland, you don't get that money for a salary unless you have a really good job. It, it's, it's, it's obscene. And you, we have, like, uh, the Irish people are changing. It's good to see this. Uh, I'm seeing in the hinterlands a, an element of change. Not in the central heating and social welfare saturated cities, but in the rural hinterlands, a small village, there's a change happening. And these are also where traditionally the fundamental heartlands of these political parties, like the mainstream ones like Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. And they're now this getting increasingly despised in these places. And for the reasons I mentioned in this video. And the, uh, the, I'll give you an example. The Ukrainian flags all went up because there was non-stop you know, Zelensky propaganda in the Irish media and government and all the, the all the Ukraine flags went up, all the NPCs and the normies and threw their Ukraine flags up. And when that was turned off, like the switch the first switch was COVID, stay home, save lives, mask. When that when was that programming was switched off and went to Ukraine, Ukraine flags went flying up. You had the mentally ill driving trucks into uh if I ever, by the way, if you were the guy who drove the truck into the Russian embassy or the priest who painted the wall, if I was ever a leader of Ireland, the first thing I would do is hand you over to, hand you over to Russians and put you on a flight to Moscow and let them deal with you. You attacked, you could have started a war with Ireland and Russia. And uh, nothing would actually, right now, the Irish establishment are so pro Hamas at the moment that nothing would bring me more pleasure than the US State Department to put the entire Irish government on a government watch, watch list, as terrorist watch list, because they deserve it. Because the Hamas propaganda went in full swing, completely full swing. Like for instance, when Israel was attacked on that Saturday and all those kids were killed at a dance festival, all they showed in the Irish media was photographs of IDF soldiers and headlines like, "Will how will Israel respond? And now with the Gaza thing, all you, when they show a picture of anything to do with Palestinians or Gaza, they'll show kids among rubble. And anything about Israel, a soldier with a gun. You can see the propaganda is completely off pro Hamas. But it's not working because the Palestinian flags did not pop up all over the place like they expected. They thought they were going to take down their Ukrainian flags 
and put up the, the Hamas flag. It never happened. It didn't fly. It's almost like people have figured out you you rolled the ball. You know the whole thing. Fool me once, you know. Shame on you. You fool me twice. Shame on me. Well, fool me three times. You know that's the end. You're done. You're done. And that's what's happened with that pro Hamas thing in Ireland. And that seems to be happening very strongly in rural areas where you don't have large Muslim populations or you know wealthy lefties like you have in the urban areas. So it's looking promising. People are seeing through it. Now, what's the answer? Will that mean there'll be a new political party and people will run out and we'll all become, you know, this, this the Ireland will, I know your country and my country and all our countries will be safe. No, it won't happen. The, the, the parallel society is, is coming. I'm seeing it in the hinterlands already. There's a, there's, a, there's a walk away from democracy movement happening, but it's not a movement, it's a one at a time. People are, you know, people, I'm not voting this year. Oh, well, well, you know, then don't complain. Why should I? Everything I vote for, they never do. Like, I'll give you an example. I'll give you guys in Ireland one example before I close the video of what's, what's going on in this country and how insane and treacherous our leadership is. The first underground railway, rail system, was planned for Dublin in 1973, the Dublin Rail Plan. It was to have an underground rail line across the city to the airport and over to Swords. In the last 50 years, that has been redrafted and rebranded and never built, even though the city has become three, th three times as populated, heavily congested, and no politician has actually signed the order to make that thing be built, right? So the capital city of the Republic of Ireland is probably the only capital city and major capital city in Europe that does not have an underground rail system, let alone a rail system to the airport. That is, that is absolutely shocking to begin with, okay? It was announced recently that Kiev was extend, extending its underground rail system. Guess who's paying for it? See you later.